But tonight I want to talk about something different that pertains to eternity. I want to talk about judgment. Now, don't get all like serious and, and scared in this place because this is actually a very encouraging message if you're a believer. Because the Bible teaches us that there are two different kinds of judgment that God, the judge, will do on the day of judgment. There's two judgments. There's one for the people that didn't believe. It's very simple. If you didn't believe and didn't accept the work of Christ, you won't be in the book of life. And if you did accept the work of Christ, if you did have a relationship with him, if your sins are forgiven, if his blood does cover you, if he has made you holy, if he has made you perfect in the eyes of the Father, then you are in the book of life and you make it to heaven. And then there's a separate judgment specifically for believers, a judgment based on our works. Ever say works? Now, before I get into too much, I, I want to tell a story. Before I tell the story, I want to read a definition. Amen? To judge as a verb is, is to form an opinion or a conclusion about something. So to judge something is to do an investigation on something and then to come to a final conclusion, a final idea about the thing that you were just looking into. Okay, and so we're all judges in our life. We all judge things all the time. Hopefully you're not judging people too much. Amen? Uh, but we all judge things. And I remember uh, a time where a friend of mine had something that I judged him for. And it was really, really smelly feet. I mean, like, and I'm, when I say smelly feet, I'm like, he didn't have to take his shoes off for it to smell. I'm telling you, the odor filled up a room. It was that kind of smell. It was like, it was like a medical issue, right? And if you're here tonight and you're hearing me talk about this friend with smelly feet, you probably know who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say who it is. Amen. <laughs> But I judged him. I would, I would laugh about his smelly feet, and every time he came around, I'd say something about it, and I would joke around about it. And then the day came where, where he was trying to get rid of some of his clothes and his shoes and different things like that, and he asked me, hey, Tyler, do you want these pair of shoes? I only wore them like two times. They're like $130 shoes. They're really nice. They were dress shoes. I was like, heck yeah, man, I want those shoes. You know, I don't really buy shoes. I only have like one or two pairs of shoes at a time, and they're usually less than $80. And so I was like, man, that would be really awesome. Thank you so much. And so I took these shoes. And little did I know that whatever made his feet stink were still inside, were still inside the shoes. And so when I would put these shoes on, because I only had like one or two pairs of shoes, I'd wear these dress shoes like every day. And, and as I wore these shoes, I started to notice that the same smell would occur even when this guy wasn't around. And I, 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 I didn't realize it fully until I was over a friend's house. And I remember taking my shoes off in the kitchen, which is like a completely different room in the house. And I come into the living room, walk all the way to the living room, sit down on the couch, and they can smell my feet. And they're like, oh my gosh, Tyler, did you take off your shoes? It would smell so bad. And, and my friend's daughter, who was probably like three at the time, would always say, Ty, Ty, your feet so tinky. Your feet so tinky. And, and I was like really embarrassed about it because I judged, I judged my friend for having stinky feet and then he gave it to me. It was like a gift that keeps on giving, amen? And, and I didn't want that, but I, I had made a premature judgment. I didn't understand what he was going through, the trauma that he must have dealt with, uh, having these stinky feet everywhere that he went. And then when I had it, I formed a different opinion. Everybody say a different opinion. I formed a new opinion. I formed a different judgment. I didn't judge him so hard like he wasn't showering or like he never changed his socks. I judged him based on like, man, I, I feel bad for this guy. He's got an actual condition and now I've got that condition, right? Thank God it's gone away. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Thank God. Grace says, really, praise the Lord. You know, like that, that thing went away and my feet don't smell that bad anymore. And so, but what changed my judgment about that thing was my experience of it. Because our experience changes our judgment. So I had a, a change of mind. I had a change of judgment based on my experience. And the Lord is, is like the same way. And it's not like he just changes his mind just based on nothing. But based on our experience with the gospel, the Lord changes his mind on how he's going to judge us. If we responded no to the gospel, or if we didn't say anything at all, if we told Jesus we didn't want a relationship with him, if we never accepted him, he's going to look at us, he's going to judge us as if we never accepted Christ. But when we come into contact with Jesus, just like I contracted that, that smelly foot disease, I don't think that's the official term, but when I contracted that smell because I came in contact with the man who had it, and when we come in contact with Jesus, we catch his holiness, we catch his righteousness, and then all of a sudden, when we meet Jesus and he changes us from an old creation to a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, guess what happens? God begins to change his mind on the way he's going to judge us. Our standard is completely different now. Now we're not being judged on all the sin that we did. We're not being judged on the things that we did wrong. Now we're being judged based on the way that Jesus lived as opposed to the way that we lived. Now this doesn't mean that we're totally off the hook, that we could just do whatever we want because there's a second judgment. And the second judgment is what I want to talk about tonight because the first judgment is very simple. If you're here in this place and you've never accepted Christ, you need to do it. 
or the, or the reality is, is that day of judgment is not going to be a joyous day for you. But if you're a believer, this judgment is actually a very encouraging and awesome and exciting thing. The second judgment is not a judgment based on our sin. It's a judgment based on our works in Christ. The things that we did, that we say we did for the Lord, right? The things that we do, the, the good deeds. Ever say the good deeds? A lot of people will say, like, as long as they do enough good deeds to outweigh my bad deeds, that's not how it works. We're, we're, we're based, where our salvation is based on Jesus, but we get rewards based on the purity of the works we do after we get saved. Does that make sense? So God changes his mind about how he's going to judge us because of the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And so his judgment changes based on his experience with us. So outside of Christ, we're judged based on sin. In Christ, we're judged based on Jesus' righteousness. Now, I'm going to read a verse, a passage in Revelation uh, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And this is a, d- a description of what the, the great white throne judgment is, what, the, what we call it because of the wording of this verse. But it's the judgment for those people who were non-believers. Okay, I'm just going to read this. It's a little scary. You guys ready? Hold on to your pants. And it's really pretty fine print, but you can probably read that from here if you're under the age of 30. Hallelujah. Revelation 20, 11 through 15, it says this, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. This is the crazy part of this verse. You ready? From his presence, the earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. That's pretty crazy. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged based by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found and written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, before I continue, I just want you to know that the Lord didn't create hell for human beings. This is not a place that God intended to throw bad people into just because they didn't do exactly what he said. That's not how it works. This is the way the world paints our father, but it's not the way that he actually is. You know, the devil actually deceived people. Hell was meant for those, those angels that rebelled against God in the Bible and for the devil himself. It was made for them. It was a place for, where the devil, because he wanted to be like God, it was a place where the devil could be God, right? It was a place where the devil could have his place. And obviously it's, it pales completely, un, it's uncomparable to the experience that he probably had in heaven. But hell was never meant for believers. Hell, not just believers, but human beings in general. And so when Satan came and he tempted us to sin, it opened up. The Bible says that hell enlarged its mouth. It extended its territory, which means it was set to a certain amount for this certain amount of angels that had rebelled. But because the devil deceived us into sin and all mankind fell into sin, it enlarged its mouth to make room for these people that weren't accepting of what God had done. These people that weren't saved by faith. And so God did something really miraculous. God sent his son so that we would have a way out of that judgment. Because I don't know about you, but I can't pay for my sins. I mean, we can, but it'll never be fully repaid. We can pay for our sins and go to a place of eternal separation from God, or we can accept the work that Jesus already paid for our sins, and we could go and experience eternal bliss in the presence of our Father with no boundaries, no borders. How amazing would that be? How amazing will that be? Amen? Now, I, I want to give some credit to uh, my friend Jack here because my friend Jack last week told me to read um, C.S. Lewis's sermon called The Weight of Glory. And if you're here tonight, it's only like eight pages long. I encourage you to read it. It wrecked me, like destroyed my whole life. I'm changed forever. Amen. I think I got resaved. And I just, I have a, a couple of quotes in here because it inspired me so much. But I just want to read a, a quote to you about what that day of judgment is going to be like. Either whether you're a believer or a non-believer. It says this, in the end, That face, which is the delight or the terror of the universe, must be turned upon each of us, either with one expression or with the other, either conferring glory expressible, inexpressible, excuse me, or inflicting shame that can never be cured or disguised. There's there's the face of the Lord that's going to look at us as if we've been accepted or rejected, and it's all based on what we did with the gospel. It's very simple. It's very easy. We, we don't have to be afraid of that day of judgment. We can be confident, the Bible says. We don't have to be afraid because the Bible says we've been perfected by faith through the blood of Jesus, through the work of Jesus on the cross. And so we don't have to fear this day of judgment, but there is a second judgment. Now, because we came in contact with sin, we contracted Adam's curse, which was death. But because we came in contact with Jesus in salvation, we contracted his holiness. 
Amen? And that's some good news. Now, here's a scripture uh, that, that reaffirms that. It's Romans 5, 18 through 19. It says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, he's talking about through Adam, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Now, that's about the work of Christ. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Everybody say amen. That's great, great news. Now we pass through that judgment of sin and we go onto a judgment of our works in Christ. Now here's the scripture. I'm reading a lot of scripture because I want you to know that this is all in the Bible. Okay, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's a good description of what that second judgment, the judgment that will be based on whether we get rewards or suffer loss. Right? But we'll be saved through this judgment, the Bible says. But based on what we did, based on our motives, based on, uh, on our intentions, and based on our actions in Christ, after we get saved, we get judged. And this is what the Bible says about it. It says this, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we're talking about all works that we're about to talk about that are going to be judged are works that are built upon the foundation of Christ, which means you ha you're saved first, and after you're saved, all these works can be either rewarded or not rewarded. So it says this, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. Those are the separation of the two. There's the, there's the uh, gold, silver, and costly stones over here, and then there's the wood, hay, or straw over here. Their work will be shown for what it is because the day, which is talking about the day of judgment, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer, will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as through escaping through the flames. Now, I, I have um, a crazy story about my, my brother and his girlfriend. They were sleeping in their house, and, and one day they heard this voice in the back of their head. They're not believers. They heard this voice in the back of their head that told them we shouldn't be sleeping in this room tonight. Let's go sleep in another room. For, for, so for some reason, the room that they slept in like every single night, they, they heard this voice, something telling them that they shouldn't be sleeping there. So they moved to another room. They listened to whatever this feeling was, this impression was. Little did they know that there was a, a house fire that was going to start in the middle of the night, and it would start in that room that they would sleep, that they would have been sleeping in. And so they moved to another room, and when the, the cats started going crazy, and their dogs started barking, and they started to smell the smoke, and they saw the smoke in the air, they, they didn't have time to gather anything that they had built their entire life. Their, this whole house is filled with memories and, and heirlooms and all kinds of uh, costly things, clothes and jewelry, pets. And so they ran out of the house as fast as they could, and, and they barely escaped with their life. And this is what the Bible says that that judgment is going to be like. For those people who, who have done works for Christ, they have done things, but they did them with the wrong motives. It says that you're going to be saved, but it's basically like you just barely escaped a, a burning house and everything that you based your entire life on will be consumed. So you'll be saved, but you'll have no reward. Now, does that sound like a very happy occasion? No. And obviously, you're going to be in heaven, so it's not going to be like depressing, right? You're not going to be depressed and, and full full of shame and all this kind of, I believe that you're still going to have this inexpressible joy because you're, you're still going to be in the presence of God. You're still going to be in heaven, but guess what happens? You don't have any rewards. And I'm going to talk about what reward that really is um, in, in, a, in the coming weeks and a little bit more tonight. And so we want to make sure that the works that we do are exposed here, whether they're pure or not, right? Because if we know if they're pure or not here, we can change. As long as you're breathing, you can change. You can change your heart, you can change your mind, you can change your intentions, you can change your motives. And the beautiful thing is you don't have to do it by yourself. You can ask God to change you, right? And so if I'm, if I'm going to run Elevate and I'm, gonna, and I'm going to preach or do worship or whatever I'm doing, if I'm going to do it so that I can be seen, so that I can be glorified, the Bible says that all the reward that I will ever get will already be found here on earth. And now I don't want the earth's rewards. I don't care if it means money and fame. It shouldn't matter to any one of us. It, may, it might be great to be used as a tool to further the gospel, but the reality is, is we don't want glory on earth. We want glory in heaven. We want to do things for, for the right reasons. We want to have pure motives. We want to do them to see the gospel further, to see the name of Jesus be glorified. Amen? Amen. So I've heard this question before, and I've asked it myself in my earlier years. So why, why do you not just do whatever you want? If you're already going to heaven, why, if you're going to heaven, you know, isn't everybody's experience of heaven going to be exactly the same? No, it's not. It's not. That's crazy to think about because 
at least for me, I had never heard this being taught until like a couple years ago, where I really thought about how my experience of heaven could be different from other believers' experience of heaven. Not that one is going to be bad by any means, obviously. Even the lowest like entry of heaven where you get no rewards but you made it to heaven, it's still going to be like infinitely better than anything you could ever experience in this world. But there, the Bible says that we could have different experiences of our eternity. Last week we said where you spend eternity is based on what you do with the gospel, but how you spend eternity is about your works in Christ. Amen? And so based on how we live our life here will determine how we live in eternity there. And that's something that we need to get in our minds. It's something we need to be so focused on every single day of our life because if we don't live for the next life, we're going to just get barely saved and we're not going to have anything, any rewards, anything to show for it. We're not going to have something that we can present to the Lord as, as a thanks offering for all that he had done. We're going to escape as barely through the flames. It's great to be saved, but I don't know about you, but I want to I do some things on this world. I want to further the gospel. I, wanna, I want people to be saved because of my life leading people to Jesus. I want to have rewards in heaven. I want my experience of heaven to be as best as it possibly can. And so the reason we don't just do whatever we want if we're already going to heaven is broken down into three parts. One, a sincerely saved person doesn't remain in habitual sin. The Bible says we're a new creation, right? You may struggle with sin, but you're not giving yourself to sin. You're not in constant habitual sin, and if you are, I encourage you to, to change. While you're breathing, you still have time to change and give your life to the Lord. But that's reason number one. Reason number two that we don't just do whatever we want is because our aim now, because our heart has been changed and our intentions have been, are being changed, and we're being sanctified, our aim is to please him in thankful response for all he's done. Right? If you, if you understand salvation even just a little bit, you are incredibly grateful for everything that Jesus had done. Not just because, not because you did so much to be able to deserve Jesus coming to you and offering salvation like you paid this price, but because we did nothing. Because I did nothing to receive this. Even the faith that I have to believe the gospel was given to me as a gift from God. I have nothing to offer God but what God already put in me. That's pretty incredible. Even the life that I have to offer God was life that he gave to me first. Right? We can only ever return what God first gave us. And the third reason is this, and it sounds kind of counterintuitive based on what we just talked about, but our third reason that we don't just do whatever we want, that we want to live to please God, is to receive glory from our Father. Now, I know how this sounds. Like, it sounds like, you know, Christians will say, like, I don't want any of the glory, all the glory to God. You hear that all the time. Glory to God, glory to God. If somebody compliments you, it's like, oh, it wasn't me, it was all God. Well, you're not that good. So it wasn't all God. But, you know, we say this kind of stuff all the time. We, we want to give God the glory, and that is completely true because God is so worthy of everything we could ever give Him. He's so worthy of all the praise, all the worship, all the honor, all the offering we could, all, the, all of our lives he's completely worthy of because of who he is and what he's done for us. But the Bible says that there will be a glorification of those who believe in Jesus. So not only do we glorify God, but God will glorify us. Now that sounds pretty insane. It sounds pretty backwards, right? That we're going to get to heaven one day and we're going to be worshiping God and God is going to be lifting us up and say, look at my son, look at my daughter, look what they did. And like I said, not based on anything we could have initiated by ourselves. This is all based on what Jesus is in. It's all built on the foundation of Christ. But the Bible says that we will be glorified by our Father. That's an incredible, incredible statement. In Romans 8, 18, it says this, I consider that our present sufferings, which are the things that we sacrifice here, it's the hardships we endure because of it, the things that we suffer, the present things, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So the Bible says that there is a glory that's going to be revealed in us. Not just to God, but in us. That's crazy. That's crazy because we, we don't think about it that way, but when we look at our, our God as a father who, who takes pride and joy in his children, in the works of his children, it makes a little bit more sense. Now, what is this glory? Because a worldly glory, definition is to be known and honored by men. But heavenly glory, this glory that is, will be revealed in us in heaven, is to be known and honored by God. Amen? In Colossians 1, 27, it says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So it's Jesus. The only reason we have any hope to be glorified in heaven for anything we've ever done is because of what Jesus did first. Everything that we do is based on that foundation. 
And then 1 Corinthians 8, 3 says, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So that, that's that glorification that happens, that you're known by God and you're honored by God. Can you imagine standing before the God who spoke the universe into existence, the God that created everything you see and everything you don't see, that God, the God that, that cared so much about your life that he sought you out, that he chased you down, that he sent everything he needed to send for you to have eternal relationship with him. Can you imagine that God giving you any glory? I, I would imagine standing before God and just falling to my knees and not feeling worthy of that glory that he's saying. I'm like, God, what are you talking about? I did nothing. What, what, what do I have to offer you? It was all you anyways. But God is going to glorify us as we glorify him. He's going to lift us up because it's the pride of a father to a child. You know, we see in, in the New Testament where Jesus is giving a lesson to his disciples. He's saying, look at the Pharisees. Look how they ring their bells and they sound their alarms every time that they give money to the poor. Or every time that they tithe, they ring this bell and, and they draw all this attention to themselves. And they pray really loud in the middle of the temple where everybody can see them. And they talk with these big words and they pray these long prayers. And they, and they got ashes on their face and they've got, you know, they've got sackcloth over their shoulders. And they just, they look really, really good. But they're all doing it to be seen by men. Jesus says those people will have all their reward here and now in this present life. All of the glory that they receive will be the glory of the people that are, are seeing them do these things. But then he contrasts their behavior to some guy that is just broken over in the corner that's not seeking any attention. He's broken before God. He's, he's weeping. He's on his knees. He's, he's praying that the Father would forgive him. He's praying for mercy, right? And he says, that is the man that you should be seeking to be like. He says, don't do, don't do your good deeds in front of men to be seen by them. Not that you're never going to do something good. Like, not that if you're in public, you don't want to good, do good things. That would be, that'd be bad. But it says, don't do those good things in order to be seen. It's a, it's a heart issue. It's a motivation. But he says, do those things in secret. And your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you openly. That's amazing. Your father who sees those things that you do, not to be seen by other people, not to be glorified by man. The thing that you do with a pure heart and a pure motive just to make God proud, just to please the Lord in your, in your present life, those things will be seen in private and revealed in the open. That's called glorification of the saints. That's where he lifts us up and he says, look at what my son has done, look at what my daughter has done, and we experience this pride of the Father. I imagine looking at his face and seeing the pride and the joy welling up in his eyes as he looks at us, as he looks at our life. How amazing is that feeling going to be? That's going to be an incredible, incredible feeling. Another C.S. Lewis quote that I have says this, The promise of glory is the promise, almost indescribable and only possible by the work of Christ, that some of us, that any of us who really chooses, shall actually sur survive that examination, the examination of God on our life, and shall find approval, shall please God. Now to please God, to be a real ingredient in the, in, in the divine happiness to be loved by God, not merely pitied. I love that line, not merely pitied. He's not just going to look at us like, oh, look at this, this awful person. I, I need to lift this person up because I feel so bad for him. He says not just to be pitied, but because of deep love to be, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work or a father and a son. It seems impossible, a weight or burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but so it is. So it is that there's going to be this moment that everything that we did in our life that was pure, that we, that we did in secret, to not to be seen by men, to be seen by God, to please God, those things, we're going to have a moment in heaven where the Father looks at us, and he's going to be so proud. He's going to say, well done. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, he's not talking just about you having joy because of all those things that you did. He's talking about how he's going to have joy over all those things that you did. Now, to bring a smile to the face of God is something that is priceless. And it's worth your entire life to do it once. Because we're created with this, this need for him. We're created with this calling to please God. More than anything, the Bible says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And so the Bible says in other places that Jesus says that if you don't enter into the kingdom of God like a child, you won't see the kingdom of God. So what is, it, what is a child like? in response to a father. What, what do kids say all the time, even though it's so annoying? I work in the kids' ministry, and kids will do this, the, the dumbest things, and they'll say, look at me, look at me. 
like, Tyler, watch this. Have you guys ever had that happen to you? They'll, they'll just do something like so simple. Like my, my niece will do this thing where she'll force us to sit down on the couch and she'll do, she'll do like, she calls it a wedding dance. And she spins around and, and after she's done, she stops and she hands us all flowers to throw at her feet. And if you throw the flower too early, she's like, I'm not done. And she picks it up and she hands it back to you and she keeps going, but she extends it longer. And so you really want to make sure that she's done before you throw the flower. But she does this thing because there's this innate desire in human beings to be seen and to be appreciated and for somebody to be proud of you, somebody important in your life to be proud of you. It's this thing that is innate in human beings. It's a need, which is why we see so many problems happen when we don't see two-parent homes especially when the father isn't in the home. When you don't get that verification and that love and acceptance from a father, it really affects people psychologically because God has created us with a need to be seen that can only truly and eternally be satisfied. And that day when we accept before him and we have lived our life to the glory of God and he looks at us and we're saying, Father, watch this. Dad, watch this. Dad, watch this. Dad, watch this. All I want to do is please you. All I want to do is for you to be proud of me. And we get to that day and he's proud of us and he smiles and he claps and he's excited. How amazing is that day going to be? And how worth it will every sacrifice, the Bible says every sacrifice is not, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to come. It's, it's worth it to live a life full of suffering to put, the, to put a smile on the face of our Father. It's worth every bit of loss. Everything that you think you're losing here on earth is going to be, it's going to pale in comparison. It's not even worthy to be compared with the glory that is going to come when you enter into the joy of your Father. That's some good news. Our deepest need and desire as human beings is to be known and acknowledged. Now, to make someone important, very proud. Make somebody important to us, I should say. It's a desire given us by design. Here's one last C.S. Lewis quote, okay? I, I, I tried not to put too many things in here, but it was so inspiring. Can we have John come up as well on the keys? It says this, our deepest, or excuse me, that was my quote. I don't want to read that again. <laughs> C.S. Lewis quote, it says this, but it must be mentioned to drive out thoughts even more misleading, thoughts that what is saved is merely a ghost. So what he's saying here is human beings have this idea, and it seems disconnected, but I'm going to connect it in a second. It seems like there's, there's this idea of heaven where all we're just going to be floating around in the clouds. We're not going to have any emotions. It's just going to be this... Right? We're just going to play harps. For eternity, it's going to be this boring, monotonous thing where we just have no emotions. We have no joy. We have no, no excitement, but we're not in hell, so we're kind of happy. And so it's just this thing that's just, just numb, and you're just going through these motions. That's what people view heaven to be like, and they say hell is like a party. Obviously, they're going to be very disappointed. But it says, thoughts that what is saved is a mere ghost. Now, what is saved in you is your soul. It's, it's the real you. So your experience here on earth, the way that you feel things, the way that you experience emotions, your, your love and your hatreds and different things like that, your experience of heaven will be even more real than your experience here on earth. Right? You're going to be completely conscious in heaven. You, it's going to be you, but you're going to be perfected. You're going to be just like Jesus, but it's going to be you. Because God created you with a personality with, with quirks and different things. And we're going to be in heaven, experiencing heaven more than we've even experienced this life. And the reason I want to say that, let me just finish this quote. Or that the risen body lives in a numb insensibility. The body was made for the Lord. And these dismal fantasies are wide of the mark, which means they're just wrong. Our experience of heaven is going to be this incredible experience of intense joy of everlasting peace. It's a place with no sorrow, no pain, no suffering. There's no sin, there's no barrier, there's no distance between you and God. It says when we see him, we're gonna see him as he truly is on that day and we're gonna become like him. And for eternity, we get to live in the joy of our master. And it matters what you do here. It matters how we live our life. It matters the way we do things. It doesn't just matter what we do. It matters how we do them. You could have two people doing the exact same things all their life. One person does it with impure motives to be seen by man, and the other person does it to please the Lord. And their rewards in heaven are going to be extremely, incredibly different. And so are their experience of heaven. Now, we only have this life to choose God while other options are available. Think about it. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be another option. There's not going to be God and sin to choose between. 
It's not going to be like, oh, do I want to do I want to read my Bible or do I want to play video games all night? Like those options don't just don't exist. When we're in heaven, there's there's no option, right? It's like, but at the same time, we don't want the option, right? When we get to heaven and there's just God is our option, we can't choose anything else over God. Just our entire existence is for God and pure joy, the way that we were created to be. But in this life is our only opportunity to, to choose God while other options are available. Which is why it's so important that we live our life right now to please the Lord. We live our life right now with pure motives, with, with pure intentions. And we do things not to be seen by men, to be seen by God so that we can please Him. The Bible says we, our goal is to be pleasing to Him here. When we're pleasing to Him here, we'll be pleasing to Him there. And that starts with a relationship with Jesus. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place right now and you're not sure which judgment you're gonna experience, you're, you're not sure that you're saved, you're not sure that you, your sins are forgiven, that you're gonna spend eternity in heaven, but you wanna start a relationship with Jesus. You wanna give him control of your life. You wanna live to please God for the rest of your days. I promise you, anything you have to sacrifice here on earth is not worthy to be compared with the things that you'll receive in heaven. First and foremost, the very presence of the living God. And if you're here right now and you've never accepted Jesus, but you want to, or maybe you've walked away and you, you want to recommit your life, recommit your heart to please God, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three and be bold about it because the Lord is looking. He, he, he desires you strongly. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Awesome. I see lots of hands. Awesome. You can put them down. I'm just going to ask one more time. If that's you, you want a relationship with Jesus want to live to please God. You want salvation for your soul. Raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Awesome. You can put them down. And what we're going to do is as a family of believers, we're going to say this prayer together. Okay, and, and as we say this prayer, I say this every single week. As we say this prayer, it's important to remember it's not this crafty list of words that we say so right that we can be saved. It's the one that we're praying to. When we, we say these words, don't say them just so that you can hear them. Say them so that the Lord can hear them. Say them to Him. Repeat this after me and we'll all join in together in support. Heavenly Father, I admit to you that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I thank you for providing the sacrifice necessary to pay the price for my sin. And right now, I lay down my life, lay down control, and I give you my heart. I ask you to make your home in me. Make me a brand new creation. All things that are old will pass away, and all things have become new. In Jesus' name. Amazing. Amazing. Now please don't let that prayer just sit in the air tonight. Please. Please let it be a heart transformation. Please let it actually affect the way you live. And, and if you need help with that, if you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, we're going to have people come up to the front right now. If you need prayer for any reason, maybe it has to do with this message. Maybe you, you just raise your hand to be saved and you have questions about it. If you need a Bible, uh, maybe you need healing in your body, any need whatsoever. Uh, I encourage you guys to come up here. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to seek God with you. But for the rest of us, I just want to have this moment of recommitment for those people that, that are already saved. But I know that every person in this room, including myself, has room to improve, has room to give more, has room to, to have purer motives, right? Our hearts need to be purified tonight. I can't wait till the day that I stand beside you guys in heaven, right? And, and we, get, we go over our lives and the Lord is proud of us because of this moment, because of this moment we choose to dedicate our hearts again to him freshly. So I just encourage you guys, close your eyes. We're just gonna say a quick prayer over all of us. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much. I thank you, God, that what you have done in your son, Lord, that, you, that he died for us and he rose again, Lord, that you didn't leave his body in the grave, but now because he is alive, we can be alive. And that though we die, your word says that we will live forever and ever with you in heaven only because of the work of your son. And Holy Spirit, I ask you right now, your word says that God, you're consuming fire and I ask you to come and consume our hearts, burn up those impure motives in us, burn up those things that distract, that take away those weights that so easily entangle us, burn it all up, God. 
our goal tonight is to be pleasing to you. And we surrender to you tonight. We just surrender our hearts. We say, come, Lord, and have your way. You're an artist. You're a potter. Come, Lord, shape us. Shape us like you. Make us like you. Purify us so that, Lord, we can not just receive rewards, but, Lord, more than anything, just to please you, just to put a smile on your face as our, as our heart's desire. And if it's not our heart's desire, we pray, Lord, that you come and make it our heart's desire. Move in us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, let's just say. Because you make all things work together for my future.